And welcome to the SpartanMag.com VCast. Jim Comproni, Paul Konerdak here at Spartan Stadium. Uh, Michigan State signing day. Mel Tucker spoke earlier. You got the, You can check that out on the, the YouTube channel over at SpartanMag.com. And uh, Michigan State came into today with the number 21 ranked recruiting class in the On3 network and comes out of the day at number 21 in the On3 uh, rankings. Um, I think Michigan State's number 36 in the Rivals.com rankings, but number 19 in the Rivals.com star average rankings. So Michigan State with 15 commitments. I think nine of them are four stars. I wasn't sure, you know, a couple of weeks ago when Michigan State was sitting at about 12 high school commitments or 11, um, I was kind of anticipating getting two or three of those guys flipped just because that's kind of what happens. Turns out none of those guys were flipped. They were able to secure all of those, which was big, and finished with Barber in the running back, three-star wide receiver Jalen Smith from Texas, three-star DB Sean Brown from Arizona, flipping him from from Arizona. So Michigan State secured it, played some defense, and then added onto that with some interesting people in the portal, scholarship-wise, and then creatively, as far as we can tell, based on what we're hearing, got some walk-on in-state guys from the portal to help with that bottom 40. Might not be ideal for the process of players in terms of long-term four-star players in your program, but Michigan State, I thought, was pragmatic, aggressive, and comes out of this with a, with a highly ranked class of high school players, strong in the portal. Right now, the portal class is ranked number one in the country in the on-three portal rankings with, I guess, 13 players in total. A lot of those are walk-ons, but aggressive and also defensive and Michigan State got it done in my opinion pretty impressively we've been doing these things for 15 years Paul doing vcast at at signing day I don't always come on here and say Michigan State was impressive top to bottom but I I was questioning where it was all headed two weeks ago but the way they finished it out I thought they did pretty well yeah, and we've seen these in the in the past. I think it's some of the D'Antonio era stuff. I, I know some people out there think I've been critical of this coaching staff at times and, and recruiting, and I, I'll be honest with you. I did not see the methodology with some of the high school stuff. I think they've missed the boat in a lot of areas with a lot of guys that they could have got earlier in the process that maybe they should have got earlier in the process, and they did what D'Antonio did back in the day when they missed out on guys or they, they fell asleep at the switch. They went out and tried to get quality dudes um, in a variety of ways. And, and I like the guys that they brought in, the three-star guys. Um, none of those guys are, are reaches. When you talk about Barber, and, yeah, he might need a year to get used to being running back. Background as a slot receiver. He's a project. He's a very yeah. fast project. But, I mean, that, that's upside. So, you, you know, you look at that speed and everyone's like, well, you got to get that speed on the field. Well, before you get speed on the field like that at running back, you've got to be able to put your foot in the ground and, and, and get a tough yard. We've seen that with, with guys. That's why the word project is, is apt in that situation. Sean Brown. Uh, a dude, a six-three dude. I just spent like a half hour talking to him and his coach, his high school coach, on the, on the phone after what Mel Tucker said today, and I learned a lot about about those dudes. You know, I didn't think Sean Brown was a really a fat, like a fast guy. He's not as fast as um, as fast as Barber, and who who might be the, one of the fastest guys in California. Um, he, you know, ten-three guy. If you're ten-three as a junior, you're flying. I mean, that's like getting up there and like elite track speed, like scholarship track yeah. speed. Yeah. Uh, but Sean Brown's a guy that's that's pretty fast for a guy that's six three, um, you know, in that one ninety range. He's a dude that you know his personal best last year was a ten nine. He ran that well pulling his hamstring. So that's a race he pulled his hamstring and he, he had a ten nine. He said he's got an achievable hundred meter time this year that he was kind of gunning for a 10-5. He thinks he can do it. So that's what he's focused on during his senior track season. And lo and behold, the 100 meters is not his best event. It's the 110-meter hurdles, which I've always felt is a great is a great football football event. AZ Johnson, Isaiah Johnson, uh, just uh, – now, he did not play at near the level in terms of competition that Jalen Smith out of, Tex- out of Houston, Texas, at the 6A level played. But you turn on AZ Johnson's film, and he does some pretty dang incredible things. Um, the way he moves, um, you know, I don't care what level you're playing. When you see that kind of stuff, it, it takes you back. It reminds me of the Keyshawn Martin film, that, you know, like when I got that copy of, uh, you know, of, of him at John Glenn from, from the administrator there. I was like, wow, you don't see this every day. Um, AZ Johnson, a dude that nobody knew about, um, you know, that's kind of like that, some of those like high ceiling D'Antonio late ads that makes you feel better about where the program is at because you know they're scouring, you know they're keeping on, you know, really looking at stuff that you need to look at and it's not just a um you know let's get this guy from the portal so i like the way 
I like the way the you know the class is kind of put together. I like some of the things they did on the defensive line. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go out. I'm not going to go out and say that I feel like this class completely met its needs, and, and I'm not sure if any class does. I think they did to the best of their ability um, meeting their needs. I would like to have seen um, maybe a four-year defensive tackle in this class. We don't know if one of those guys that's listed right now as an edge guy ends up being a defensive tackle. Mm -hmm. A lot of times guys grow into that. Mm -hmm. And some of these guys have the frames to do that. But Michigan State got its numbers up on the interior defensive line. Absolutely had to happen. Now you've got six scholarship interior defensive linemen to, to work with. I'm not saying that any of the, either – I'm not saying that any of those guys is, is going to be – absolutely better than any of the guys that left the program, but they have the numbers now, and and that's important. I think the two guys that signed this morning, um, I think those guys are rotation guys. I agree with with you on that. Uh, but you need rotation guys to win win football games. And then the kid that transferred in from Texas A&M, um, he's had two years to show something. He hasn't really, but he does have upside. And uh, at some point, that has to turn into um, you know on-field production. And uh, Hopefully he can get the job done for Michigan State, but another big-bodied athlete, and you can't have too many of those. I think Michigan State did a nice job um, in a lot of different areas in this recruiting class. I'd like to see a punter uh, in this class. Uh, you know, they got to get something done. But the kicker, that's another a big add. You know, we don't look at that kind of stuff all the time. You know, kicker and Michigan State absolutely had to have a kicker in this class. I feel I feel good about that. I feel good about the receivers, as I mentioned. Um, they check a lot of boxes in this class. So there's not – it's not one of those classes you look at that is ranked in the top 25, but it doesn't meet program needs. Um, and we've seen some of those in the past. I think of the 2009 class during the Mark D'Antonio era, a lot of those guys, you know, they needed edge rushers at the time. They didn't get them in that class. So they got some decent pieces. But to me, that wasn't a real top 25 class or it didn't quite meet the needs of the program at that time. I think this one does, but you really don't know. Um, and Mel Tucker said as much – especially with the, with the interior linemen, not with the interior linemen, but with the edge rushers, the three high school guys, you won't know for a year or two whether these guys are on, on track. The scary thing about edge rushers coming in from high school ranks, if they don't do it right away, are they going to be there? But that's the case with everybody in college football right now. Mm -hmm. And 15 high school guys, it's hard to check all the boxes with only 15. Um, I asked Mel Tucker if they had a set number of high school kids they wanted to get, you know, if they came in thinking 15 high school and seven junior or transfer guys. And he said they didn't have a, a straight number. They were going to cap it off however many high school players they thought that they had without taking any reaches, which I thought was kind of a healthy way to go about it, um, provided that you get 15 good ones. And you look at these 15 players, and we say it, I say it every year, that statistically if two-thirds of your high school recruits end up winning two – Letters, that's good. 67% is good. Uh, a lot of times you might get into today. I don't know what those percentages are going to be in the, in the day and age of the transfer portal. Basically, 15 good quality high school prospects. There's no way all 15 of them are going to win two letters. But all 15 of them are good candidates. You know, a lot of people analyze these recruiting classes like, hey, that's 15 good players. They're all going to be great. That's ridiculous. That's not going to happen. One third of these guys are going to be moving on if, you're, if you do it well. But I look at these 15 players, and I, I've said it before with other classes, I can see why Michigan State likes all of them. I look at 15, and I see 12 or 13 of them that are, I think are like plus, plus capability guys. And that's why Tucker had to do so much defense to fend people off. When you have 9 out of 15 that are four-star recruits, that's high quality. Now, they've got to come in and, and get acclimated, and, and you have to de-recruit some of these guys a little bit. Um, some of them have to, you know, show proper commitment and everything. But in terms of raw ability, you look at someone like By Job. I mean, he's different, different, you know, edge athlete out there. Something that the program has needed down the road. I think he's got a chance to be really good. And to Pape, the guy from Iowa, he's got great ability too as a defensive end. Now he has to show a level of, uh, you know, poise and maturity, and he's got to toe the line in a lot of ways. Um, but he has excellent ability at a position where it's hard to get, to get players. You know, um, then you get into the portal and you and you, you you bolster what we're talking about. You know, you have Simeon Barrow coming back at defensive tackle, and uh, uh, you know Maverick Hanson and Derek Harmon. They're they're good with those three, but what's coming up in the future that remains a question. They go to the transfer portal. They got Tumise Adelaye. Like you said, he's not quite proven himself at the college level. Former top 55 star type of guy. He's got a couple of years of eligibility left, maybe even three. But, 
you know, um, and then Dre Butler played last night for Liberty. And um, I talked to Tucker last night. I was like, what was it like to be f- finalizing a recruit and you watch on TV and a guy's playing a, a game, a bowl game, and you're going to sign him tomorrow? He said, that was a new one. That was a new one. And we mentioned on the Underground Bunker message board earlier today that Dre Butler's parents were here for an official visit this past weekend. Uh, they came without Dre Butler because he was preparing for the bowl game. That's an interesting way to go about it. I've not watched his film yet. I taped that game. I'll go back and watch it. But in terms of depth there, the defensive tackle position with Jared Jackson coming in from Florida State, that's another guy that's always had ability, 6'5", 300, big guy. But he's never played more than 200 snaps right. in a season, and he's been around since 2018. So you got some hungry. You know, maybe he's hungry. Maybe it'll click for him. Maybe he's, he'll stay healthy. Dre Butler's bounced around a little bit. You got and, and then too many say Adelaide comes in. He's been bouncing around. Those guys have ability, but they're going to be new. And this is a program that Tucker likes to say is process driven. You got to come in, and the standards the standard, and all that stuff is good. But that stuff needs to take hold after two years, three years, four years in the program. And they're doing that with some players, but these guys, the defensive line, you get them on campus for three or four months. You know, getting that all to work together is a challenge. I thought that Michigan State has had really good togetherness and camaraderie on their team the last two or three years, including two years ago when they went 11-2. and two. And this year when they went 5-7, and seven, I thought the togetherness was really strong. Just got hit by injuries and some other problems. They've had good um, harmony and uh, you know workmanlike attitude up and down the roster. Um, that's they'll keep trying to, to get that, but there's no guarantees there. And doing it this way is uncharted territory. Michigan State with, with 13 guys in the transfer portal – and the in-state walk-ons, those guys have some talent. And I think what's going on there is what is what happened. Remember last year when the Brigham Young uh, donor came out and said he was going to be giving money to all the walk-ons? Um, what's going on here with Michigan State with in-state walk-ons? They pay in-state tuition. They can get some other aid in other areas. Who knows what's going on with name, image, and likeness? But something's going on, Paul, when you have Power 5 guys transferring in and not accounting for scholarships. That's not a bad way to, to try to be pragmatic about bolstering your bottom 40. Yeah, and the other thing, the other thing, too, you look at these guys, it's not – I mean, let's be, let's be like, real in some ways with, with these guys. A lot of these guys are three – this is their third school, right? right? They've gone to different schools and it hasn't worked out for what, whatever reason. And, and these guys, I mean, w- these guys want to come home. Mm-hmm. I think they want to play in a program near home. They want to be part of something. Well, if they get Pearson, I mean, he's played well. No, Pearson's different. But I'm talking about like when Pe- he's Pearson, the, the safety Wait, listen, from. I'm, I got to tell them who Pearson is yeah. in case they don't know. Reggie Pearson, safety from Texas Tech, originally from Detroit, River Rouge, went to Wisconsin, was an immediate impact player there. Texas Tech had about 60 safety, 60 tackles this year. He's a proven player. But he's not a walk-on. What I'm talking about is these guys that have been for three, three, three years or three different programs, or this will be their third program. Pearson's going to come in as an in-state walk-on. It, well, we, we don't know for sure because uh, – I don't think so. Well, we don't know for sure because that he was one of the three players that Tucker could not talk about today. Right. So the players he could not talk about are guys that are walk-ons. Now, Pearson hasn't committed yet. If he had been committed, we would know for sure. Yeah, I don't – I think that he might be the exception to that because I, I just feel – just They've got room for one. Now, here's the other thing. They've got room for scholarships this spring. So if someone's coming in in January, they've got scholarships left over for spring semester, then they'll shuffle it back again I, in August and see where they are. I'm just saying – So I, some I would, of these guys could end up on scholarships. Yeah, I'm, you know, like this is the early signing period too. So a guy like like Pearson is not. I, I just don't see that guy not coming in a, a in a scholarship scenario. No, some of these other guys are different. That's why mm-hmm. I consider him a scholarship guy. Okay. And uh, so, you know, that's that's why that's why you I'm may not, very well be right. You may very. Go I mean, ahead. You, that guy is not. That's not a guy you attract back with with financial aid. Um, you know, I I don't I don't think. I, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. So. Uh, Okay. But but I think he he's one of those guys that, that checks off off some boxes. I, I like that 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 addition. Um, but this is you know there's some good things. There's some really good things in this class. I, I, the thing that Michigan State needs to do moving forward, and Mel Tucker said this at, at camps. He said a bunch of times that you don't he doesn't want to be too trans transfer portal reliant. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know like last year he said it several times. Like, He'd like to do build this thing through the high school ranks. Well, that's hard to do if guys that are in backup positions, whether you know, like like Deshaun Mallory and Jalen Hunt, you know, aren't willing to be in backup positions. Mm-hmm. You know, so and there's nothing Michigan State can can do about that. They can recruit those guys all they want and say, you know, you're going to play this 
however many snaps, but at some point these guys want to be more than you know backups. Now they may never be more than backups. They may never be more than reserves, and and that may still be the case with some of the guys coming in from the portal. But they want that opportunity. So it's really, in my opinion, it's really hard kind of to build through the high school ranks in some ways if if you're getting guys at developmental positions that be that the offensive line, tight end, um, defensive line and they're not sticking around to go through the initial part of the process it takes to get on the field. There is, with dudes, a process. We were talking about this before, you know, before uh, the signing of the press conference. I was watching, no disrespect to Chase Carter, but I was watching some of his practice film that he had out there. Um, it highlights that he wants to be recruited or whatnot, and I'm thinking, okay, this is a guy that is going up against walk-ons and uh, true freshmen in – not ready to play snaps in year one. He was raw coming in, knew there was going to be some de development, de development that had to happen. And this is a guy jumping on the, to the portal, and there's a lot of guys out there like that. In year one, they're not ready to get on the field, whether it's offensive line. You know, like Keonta Goodwin, for example, with, with Kentucky. Man, there's people out there that are saying that Keonta Goodwin's no good. He's a freshman. I, you've got to go through the process. That's why everyone talks process, process, process. There's certain positions where you can't just jump into the mix. And even if you do, it's not always advisable. You there's, know? there's plenty of offensive tackles in the National Football League that did not play right away as an 18-year-old freshman in college. You look at Flo's, Any, Flo's that, Adams. Flo's Adams. I mean, that's a great Any, I mean, there's some that do play, but anyone out there that says that Goodwin is no good based on one year is, is, in, is ignorant when it comes to college football. But, but at, the same time, at the same time, there's so many of these guys that aren't – He you, may not prove to be good, but you can't close the door on someone right. in one year at that position. And there's a lot of guys that aren't as talented as Goodwin at a lot of these positions that are making jumps before they're even ready they're even ready to compete for a roster spot at their own school let alone somewhere somewhere else and I think that's a problem I, I think it's hard you know so for Mel Tucker to want to build through the high school ranks I think they've got to keep on going for that because you don't want to get mm -hmm. in a situation where you're bringing in roster you don't you're bringing in defensive linemen into especially interior defensive linemen year after year to fill roster holes because if you look at the top 50 of, uh, you know, the available defensive tackles out there, you know, guess what? The guys that left here are up in the top 20, you know, in the, in the, on, th in the, in the on three rankings. You're looking at, you know, like the number five, 15 guy, I believe that that was Deshaun Mallory, and then Jalen Hunts is listed as number 17 ranked guy. So both the guys coming in are ranked below, below him. Of course, the unseen is undefeated, so people feel good about this. But ideally, you're going to want to try to, you know, develop these guys within your program, just like Jacob Slade did, just like Derek Harmon did, you know, just like even Simeon Barrow. And uh, you're going to take some lumps early on. So it's, it's, a, it's a tough deal. And Mel Tucker said as much today about balancing everything. It is, it's, there's a lot of balancing. To he, said, he said there 4,000 players went into the portal that first week of December. The first day, he said. Where are the good ones? I mean, <laughs> I mean if, if Hunt and Mallory are like top 20 defensive linemen, and you look at you know Nathan Tucker, the guy coming in from UConn. He looks okay. He's the number five running back in the portal. He looks okay. I mean, I kind of project him to be somewhere well, around where Broussard and Eli Collins are, just below Berger. That's what I'm thinking with him. I mean, quarterback. Everybody knows there's there's excellent ones at the quarterback position, but four thousand. And and I, I agree. I mean, the defensive tackles. It kind of becomes becomes a wash. Now Michigan State went after some big time high school defensive tackles. If they had gotten them, they would have signed them and not these, these transfer portal guys. So they're doing what they can. You know, they got 15, I think, quality high school prospects. If they could have gotten 20 like this, I think they would have and only gone two in the portal. Yeah. So they kind of stopped where they felt they needed to stop. But the portal guys, it's, it's a, it's a crapshoot on some of those guys. It, it is in the, in the uh, you know, the, the running back. You know, Tucker was, uh, you know, Nathan Scott, Tucker was complimentary of him, mentioned that he runs a, you know, a 4 4 Five. You know, the thing I don't know about him is you're playing with UConn. You don't know. I've seen his, his top end speed, and it's, it's, it's like Bruce Ard. And yeah, like I want to see what. Not, I don't know if it's. Four, you know, I, I'm not saying it is or it isn't. I mean, there's guys that, there's guys that supposedly have four or five speed that it doesn't mm -hmm. look like that on the, on the field. And there's guys like Le'Veon Bell at his prime that had four or six speed, and it looked like four or three because of the way he moved laterally. So I'm not saying Nathan Scott is, is going to be a, a great player. Pro Football Focus did have, you know, did have him grayed out as, you know, before his injury is the number one running back in the, you know, he was on grade. Yeah, he was ranked number two or three in the country in yards 
in the, at the FBS level at that point, going into week number four, he'd put up a lot of yards. I watched the game against uh, all of his touches against Wyoming and all of his touches, I think, against Nevada or something like that. And he rushed for like 190 against someone Nevada, I think. He had like a 50-yarder and was caught from behind. He has good vision. He does a real good job. What he does a good job of is he sets up blocks well. He'll take it this way in order to give his blocker an angle and then cut off of it. He does a good job with that. So I think he, he can be productive. Um, but if they get Kedrick Riscano, they may not have gone. They probably wouldn't have gone after him. So that's kind of a plan B thing. Riscano, he's four-star, all this, all that. I, he doesn't have next gear speed either. Right. And he'll go down to Ole Miss, and I wouldn't be surprised if he's in the portal in a year or two. So, I mean, so that's there's a, no guarantee. So, we're talking about the portal here, I, I think it's interesting to think. And we've, you know, some of what Mel Tucker said today when asked questions specifically about the portal j- tracks with what he said when we had din- we had lunch with him uh, in the summertime about, you know, the wild, wild west nature of the portal right now, um, not being a lot of data out there. So, um, you know, people are talking about huge money being thrown around. Is it actually being thrown around? And when will every, when will the dust settle? You know, when will one of the, some of the big schools that are used to having their way and aren't going to like some of the money being thrown around? When did they put their, put their weight out there with the NCAA? When, when are there some guidelines, some guardrails? And I think, honestly, with the way this thing is going, with the way you're starting to see uh, college coaches complain publicly and, uh, you know, and power programs, uh, you know, not being the, you know, not getting guys maybe that they would otherwise. You're, I think you're going to see – Tucker feels like there's going to be more clarity on how this whole thing works within the next year, and, and he seemed to be pretty confident with that. What he said today isn't a one-off from what we've heard him say before, going back to, to you know, that lunch that we had in the summer. Um, I, I feel like a lot of coaches are going to be talking about some sort of guardrails for the portal, and, and I think it has to happen too because, you know, it's – it's one thing paying for someone's name, image, and likeness, but it's the other thing, uh, you know, just turning it into a, you know, a cash grab without, you know, without doing anything. It, you know, it's like it's like, you know, basically like duffel bags for for nothing. I mean, you're supposed to be paying for someone's name, image, and likeness. What what are you doing to get that? I mean, I get it if you're representing United Airlines and you're in a commercial, or uh, you know, you look at some of the guys like, like I've seen down in Indiana, some of the dudes from down there in the basketball program are, you know are doing ads or their, you know, their face is being used like Trace Jackson Davis for some of the regional health systems. That's, that, that's that, what, that's what it's yes, supposed to be. And that's what they sued for going back to the O'Bannon case. And that's, that's yeah, okay. And that's a whole lot different than having, you know, than having like it turned into a political campaign and being like, Hey, we're going to get all these grassroots donors to call an 800 number. And, and, and you knew, and you knew it was going to go that way. Oh, heck yeah, we did. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious, but there's going to be a correction. There always is. And, uh, and it usually happens when when the haves, the traditional haves, are starting to get some taste of have not. Well, you know, Michigan State went after Oku Lola really hard, the offensive lineman from Boston. Miami ended up getting him, and Miami's very aggressive with the money right now. Ruiz is the big donor, billionaire, and Miami is desperate. They want to get back to winning, and they're willing to throw that money out there. Offensive line, you know, pay a guy. Yeah, that's what you know, upwards of a couple million dollars over four years. Uh, offensive line. You know, they, they have a higher bust rate than any other position. And I think Okun Lolo's got a lot of talent. Right. I think he's excellent. But they have a higher bust rate. You know, injuries happen with shoulder and clavicle and, and, and things like that at that position. It takes that position longer to gain traction. Back, back so, injuries, neck so, injuries. So he's going to – you know, there's going to be a lot of expectation there for a teenager coming in at that position. Secondly, does he remain as hungry as he would have if he were coming up 10 years ago? Heck no. So there's going to be – you yeah. know, there's, there's. I've talked to a few. And you know who's going to be hungry? Appalachian State, who beat Texas A&M this year with nobody on the payroll, because those teams like Appalachian State and Western Michigan and Troy State, they're getting the same players they always had, and they're going to be hungrier. And A&M and whoever the powers are, they're going to get the same players they already had, but now they're going to be paid. Are they going to have as much will and camaraderie right. as usual? There's going to be middle, mid, mid-major football teams that do it right. They're going to jump up and and beat these teams. I think I think I think maybe even more than than it used to be. Yeah, I think I think you make some good points, and it's it's kind of like what we've seen in basketball over the years. You know, a lot of you know there was a, a lot of untowardness in a lot of got money exchanging hands and guys going to different programs, but there's not many coaches that could really handle that and win with that. You know, it, it's it's different. And if you're talking about a, a developmental position like offensive line where there's a good share of guys that were former walk-ons that develop into starters. Some of those guys end up in the, in the league and you're, and you're sitting there and you've seen 18 year old, like getting paid a million dollars 
allegedly to to be on a, on a team. I'll, I'll tell you what that just to me that's a bad that's a bad investment. And you know it's di- it's a, it's a little bit different if you're bringing in a Bo Jackson or uh, you know Deion Sanders type or someone that you know like you know is going to make a difference. I just don't see where the return investment is on that, other than right. per, other than per, perception. All right, back to this class. I agree with what you're saying about Sean Brown, and at six three, he's got really good speed. Chance Rucker is a guy that I think also has a chance. Uh, no pun intended, a four star guy that quietly committed, and there was no drama. They play a position of of need. Michigan State's got it, got open, you know, rehearsals there at the corner position. And as far as true freshmen go, usually they can make an immediate impact sooner at wide receiver and corner. As the saying goes, the further away you are from the ball, the better chance you have to help early. We saw Michigan State with some safeties this year that played early. But those corners, you know, you're bringing back at the corner position. You know, you're losing Williams. You're losing Amir Speed. You know, Chester Kimbrough, does he come back as a slot guy? Uh, You've got Charles uh, Brantley. um, But there's the open competition there going on. And Chance Rucker and Eddie Pleasant, I I like Rucker a lot. I think he's got a chance coming in from Texas, has a chance to do some things. Long term, we talked about by Job and DePape, if he can toe the line and do everything he needs to do. But uh, Stanton Ramil, yeah, the I offensive like lineman from Alabama, um, he's going to be a long way from home at a position where it's harder to, to gain traction and play earlier. But that guy physically looks like a college player right now. And he went down to the Mississippi-Alabama All-Star game and was excellent in practice. You watch him move. And uh, I know Michigan State's really excited about him, four-star guy, and – I'm just amazed that Michigan State could go down there, get traction with him early, that far away from home, and then you know hang on to him with with, with you know there were schools trying to get in on him. I just talked to Tucker about it, but he stayed the course. And Michigan State quietly or loudly, depending on how much you pay attention to this, Stanton Ramil is is, a, is, a, is an excellent talent for the future. Yeah, this is like pretty impressive to me. Like the three offensive linemen they brought in, Dellinger, uh, you know, Keyshawn Blackstack. Which really the recruitment to me reminded me a lot of what we saw with Fofanoni, where yeah. Michigan State developed a, a relationship with the player, developed a relationship with the coach to the point where the coach, offensive line coaches in JUCO, they want to know that their guys are going to get taken care of. And I think Chris Kapilovich, uh, Kapilovic did a hell of a job developing yeah. that relationship, earning trust of the coach because those guys go to bat when it comes time for for guys like Keyshawn Blacksack. Uh, uh, Mel Tucker had the previous relationship, having known him from Georgia, um, you know, so that. That that helps a little bit, but the all offensive line class, this class stacked against a really good class last year, and then we're seeing some good things from the one two years ago, where some of those guys like a Geno Vandermark, uh, Kevin Wigginton, some of those guys, even Ethan Boyd getting on the field, uh, starting to develop. Brandon Baldwin. So, offensive line numbers, like one of the big stories today that you know we probably wouldn't have time to cover is like offensive line numbers are starting to get back, and and you look at some of the guys, you. Really, about at guys that are away from home, like you, you talk about uh, Ramil. When you work your tail off, <clears throat> when you're willing to do embrace the process, when you're a guy that's willing to grind and work every day in practice, your teammates, especially on the offensive line, they embrace you and they and they take you in and and they show you the ropes. And, and I think these guys have the demeanor, um, they've got the ability, and, and I think they're going to fit right in. I like this offensive line class. Yeah, yeah they're last good year, people too. The, the people you mentioned, and then also Braden Miller and Ashton yeah, Lepo. Oh yeah, Lepo traveled to Penn State, so those guys are on. They're on schedule. We haven't seen them. I was hoping there'd be bowl practices right. this year, and we might be able to get in and see one of those. I was going to try to lobby to get us all in for that, but it, it, there were no bowl practices. Hopefully in spring practice we might get a chance, but we'll keep our ear to the ground and see how those guys are developing. But, um, you know, the Keyshawn Blackstock, number one interior junior college offensive lineman in the country, and Michigan State got in on him several – a couple months ago – and start to finish, and it did not end until this morning. And I know Michigan State was very happy to get him, and they think he's an immediate impact guy. You've got him out there at, uh, at you know, he'll compete with Brandon Baldwin at left tackle, and you know, Blackstone could Blackstock could could move into interior, and so so that helps right away at that position. Theoretically, they're they're pretty excited about it. The him. nice thing about that one with him, as opposed to going back to Foe, is Foe was like a fall arrival. This dude is here in the spring, so he's going to have a chance to, you know, mm-hmm. Michigan State's going to have a chance to actually get a good look at him if they want to move him around, see what he can do, get him kind of like up to speed. You can't really do that necessarily with a guy in the in the fall. You really have to make a, a decision early on where you think his best fit is, and you know, and, and stick with it. That's big that he'll be here. Yeah. yeah, and we haven't mentioned uh, Ken Talley also, the defensive end, who 
was added as a transfer back in September when he left Penn State for, for various reasons. He's a defensive end that also can help with the edge going forward. They didn't mention him here today, but that's a guy that, that practiced, and um, you know, he's technically one of these transfers. But for the future defensive end, that, that picture could look different. There's a lot of talented guys, an influx of talented guys there. Unknown as undefeated. We haven't seen them yet, but that's, that's something good there for Michigan State. Linebacker position, Jordan Hall coming in from IMG. Um, I think he looks okay. Um, you know, he's been highly ranked and everything. I've got to go back and watch some more film. His junior film, I thought, was just kind of like, kind of like Nateote a little bit. You know, it's four star and everybody's excited. Uh, you know, I was like, okay, I want to see senior film. I saw a little bit. It looked a little bit better. I've got to go back and watch some of that. They had a commitment from Javon Brown, who's shorter, but I thought it was more explosive, and he ended up decommitting. And a lot of people acted like that was okay, no big deal. Well, they didn't. Sign, they didn't add another linebacker. They went out and got an Aaron Alexander, a walk on right. from UMass, but. It's not like they had, you know, a player to be named later just to, to, to uh, punch right in there. So the linebacker situation, T Tucker said that he feels that they've got good depth there at linebacker and they only need one, he kind of indicated. They had two committed at, at this time yeah. last week. Um, he didn't mention whether Winman's coming back and Brule's coming back. Brule said that he planned to come back in this, you know, to, to Ricardo Cooney about a month ago. And Winman, if Winman's not already in the, in the NFL declare pool, then I assume he's coming back. Uh, but the fact that they only signed one linebacker, maybe that's an indication that Brule and Winman are for sure coming back, but Tucker stopped short of saying that today. Now, Nateote was in the portal last year. He came back. He hasn't played. Does he go back in the portal? We don't yeah, know. I mean, like, you, 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 still have, you still have Halliday, Winman, and you know, Brule. Um, and then, then you add, I don't know if Hall's going to be ready right away. Uh, I, I, I kind of expected another high schooler in there. As far as the go ahead, what were you gonna say? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Some of those guys, some of those guys, you don't want those guys saying necessarily they're coming, they're coming back right now. Some of those guys might not want to. I mean, Tucker's not gonna, you know, maybe maybe they are up in the air. But maybe if you say, you know, these guys are coming back, then you have an out flux of talent. You know, so I, I think it behooves Michigan State to be a little bit vague on who's coming back and who's not uh, until spring, and then you know. It's one thing for some of those young linebackers to see where they are in the spring, and if they feel like that, that that they're not where they need to be, then you'll see more more guys hit the portal. I, I think you have to see linebacker be more of a priority. Um, you know, I'm not sure if uh, you know the linebacker commit. You know, sometimes we see those guys in that 250 range. Sometimes they, you know, they don't stick there, and uh, you know, a lot of guys seems like a lot of the, the linebackers we've covered. That have gone on to be good linebackers here, athletic ones, were 200, 205 in high school. I think that's where recruiting analysts sometimes really miss the mark with linebackers. I feel like a lot of times those 240, 250 pounders are given the benefit of the doubt or they're seen as somehow superior because they have that size. To me, that's like a, like a 1980s framework because you look around the NFL, there's, you know, I mean, besides with guys that play like the 3 4 and stuff like that, there's yeah, you know, like a four-three linebacker. I mean, you don't see many guys that are two forty, two fifty, and um, you know. So I always, I'm always hesitant about that. You know, some people. What, are, what do they list Hort Hall at today? Is they, he two thirty-five or something like that? That's, that's kind of heavy. You like, know, like when Darius Snow, when when he was demoted from four-star to three-star at two oh five, because they, you know, he wasn't running that fast as a safety. I was telling people at the old, uh, the old system. I'm like, he's he's not a safety. He's a, he's a college linebacker. Yeah. And I mentioned that to Darius, and Darius, no, I'm not. I'm right. like, yeah, I thought myself. Did. Yeah, you, yeah, you are. So he's like, yeah. he's like uh, the Will Golston who never wanted. To, he still probably wouldn't admit he's a defensive yeah. lineman. Yeah. So, uh, it, it, as far as being, you know, Michigan State's going to have to uh, wean itself from the transfer portal. Some of these positions going all the way back to the John L. Smith era. John L. Smith became addicted to junior college defensive tackles there for a while, and then it's, they kind of had to replenish that, and they could never dig themselves out of the hole. They kind of got by with it to an extent, but Michigan State has gone transfer portal at running back over and over and over. They try to get uh, high school running backs this year. Ended up with Barber, and we'll see how he, he turns out. So they, they, they got away from that a little bit, but you bring in Nathan Tucker again from the portal, and we'll see where that leads them. And also at tight end, you know, they had Parachek. He's a big-timer from Dexter. I like him a lot. And, you know, Michigan came after him last night, and they've been hovering around with him uh, for quite a while. Uh, he's a good, solid, consummate, you know, tight end straight out of central casting should be good give him time let him develop that's good for the future in the meantime you know you're losing 
you know, Barker, one and done transfer portal guy. Tyler Hunt, they were fortunate that that he came in as a punter and, and gave them some some minutes. Um, and then Malik Carr, coming in transfer portal wide receiver, he's got a good future also. But he's a transfer. Barker's a transfer. Hunt was a punter, walk on. The tight end situation, they, they signed Nickel last year and Masunas didn't see them at all. We'll have to wait and see what they become. Parachek, those three need to really solidify that thing coming forward. In the meantime, they go out and get Franklin from Minis- from Wisconsin, transfer portal, and uh, um, Hopper from Boise State, transfer. Those guys are kind of, in my opinion, they're, they're kind of Tyler Hunt type of blockers. I think they're a little bit better than Powers Warren, but they're mature bodies that have been on the field, 22, 23 years old, because right now you're, you're relying on Parachek and two redshirt freshmen, so you're going to be young there. So I understand why they went and tried to get some veteran bodies at tight end. But do they have anybody at tight end that can make a difference? It's got to be Carr because the rest of them aren't difference makers right now. Yeah, I think Malik Carr, like from what he showed me, like, like you couldn't – I would have a hard time. You could tell me that the other two guys, Tyler Hunt – and uh, Daniel Barker were better blockers. You could say uh, run blockers, and you could say that. You know, I don't care what they graded out as far as pass pro. I'm just I'm talking about what you need at a tight end to be successful and run in a, in a pro style offense. That's what this is a pro style offense. You need run blocking tight ends, and you can't tell me that Barker or Hunt. And I know Hunt tried his best, and he did as good a job as he could. Um, but you can't tell me that you can't tell me that Malik Carr was not as good. Uh, or appreciably worse than those guys as run blockers. I think he was better. You know, in some ways he is better. Now, none of those guys are perfect. He improved up to mediocre. Right. So but, he's got he's got but that's further to go, which he can do. But but that's different than being mediocre as a fifth year senior as, yes. Bar- as Barker was, or uh, you know, being functional. I'm not going to say Tyler Hunt was mediocre because I have respect. I have respect for him. I'll say functional, but you wish he would have done more. Bottom line is they didn't get the block out of the tight end position they needed for the run right. game. They tried, they did their best, but they, that's an area where they so can. I mean, they, so you know, Nickel, Masunas, those guys, Parachek, that's the future. And I believe Malik Hall has the mentality. I believe he's got like kind of the he's got kind of a little Malik nasty Carr. streak. No, in no, I mean, you've caught my disease. Malik, no, sorry Malik about Carr. That. Malik Carr. I, I think he's got the want to. I think yes. he's got the athleticism. Yeah. I think he took big enough strides. And if you look at where he was this year as opposed to last year when he came in late wasn't even there in the summertime mm-hmm. uh, because he came in so late late from Purdue and where he wasn't even like when we had that they had the open thing that we watched you know he wasn't even really out there doing reps you know like they, you know late late so I, I think he's taken some strides as a blocker I think he wants to be that guy wants to be a complete tight end and I think he's their best chance and I'm interested to see what Nicola Masunas do I think it's I think it was uh, noteworthy that Mel Tucker mentioned those guys prominently, while also saying that they feel like they upgraded the overall talent in the, in okay. the room. And they brought in another portal walk-on. Uh, Adam, I guess he's not a walk-on because they listed him. Adamola Falei from Norfolk State. They mentioned him, so he must be going on scholarship at least for this spring. Uh, I wouldn't expect much from him. He's an athlete. He's not a blocker at all right now. So that's that's down the road. We'll, I, I've said my piece on him. But, hey, Michigan State um, – Overall, like I said, two weeks ago, I wasn't so sure. But Tucker, you know, Tucker really hustled, and, and, and he worked his tail off, and then he pushed the staff, and they worked their tail off. And he's a guy that still likes doing the work. Right. He wasn't like, oh, man, this was a drag. This was so much work. He was like, he's tired, and he's looking to take a day off now. But he embraced it, and he's happy with it. And, and you know what? I, I think that he knows that if they can get back to winning eight, nine, ten games – he wants to go back out there again with a new facility and give it another sh- another try and bring in another group of four stars next summer and see if they can get you know more than nine. I, I think he, he I think he's heartened by this. I think he's encouraged. Right. We don't have a lot of time left. We gotta but, go. They're but, tipping but, off but, in thirty three minutes. But one of the things we would do every year, and we not, didn't do this uh, this year. We're not gonna sing carols, are we? No, no, no. Well, Darn. you don't want to hear that. Guys that you think, when you look at this thing, guys that you think have a chance to over achieve or be special players. I'm going to go first on that. I think the two receivers. Wide receivers. Two, you know, hey. Oh, man, I almost said something to put. I almost put something in the swear jar. The two wide receivers, man. I look at, as far as having two three-star wide receivers, Mm -hmm. the last time I felt as good about two three-star wide receivers was after talking to coaches on signing day in 2015 when they were absolutely raving about Felton Davis and Daryl Stewart, you know, and there's some parallels there, obviously, both being for Virginia and Texas, um, you know, different type of receiver. Felton Davis was a big dude, uh, but Isaiah Johnson's got a ton of potential. And he's also a guy that, man, if 
if he isn't getting on the field right now and they and they want to throw him in at corner or something like that, that's a dude that played mm-hmm. corner as a youngster. And, he, you know, that's one of those guys. It would not shock me, and we see this from time to time, guys that are athletes that want to get after it, and he has an attack personality. It, they might try him at corner. But Isaiah Johnson and then uh, Jalen Jalen Smith, mm-hmm. uh, you did a nice job on that, on that story. But you can't, you know, I tweeted this last night, but you can't fake your way. Uh, to those kind of numbers um, at that level of football in the state of Texas. So I, li- I like your choices. You know, with only 15, um, with only 15 high school players, and nine of them are four stars. That only leaves you with six that are three stars. So there's not a whole lot of people that, uh, you can, that can get into okay. the, like the the underrated category. So but you can do two, a four. You can do a four star, or we can do like you know, you can do like. I would say those two, and I'd put I'd put Sean Brown in there too at six three. And, you know, Tucker was talking about his 10-9 speed or whatever it was. He said 10-7. And, and he said he could also be – was he the guy that said he could also be a, a, a Power 5 wide receiver? Yeah, and his coach said that too. And, you know, and, like, and that's what I wrote down when I'm watching him at six foot three, And he's making plays as a wide receiver. I mean, one-handed grabs, and he's hitting people. And you know who he looked like? He looked like Justin Lane. Right. Now, he didn't hit as hard. Justin Lane hit hard right. in high school. And he was a guy that played two positions here. And played in the NFL. When I was watching Sean Brown as a three-star, I'm like, that guy reminds me of Justin Lane. And those two receivers. And Michigan State is kind of replenishing that wide receiver situation. Jane Reed moves on. Jeremy Bernard moves on. And now you're getting the, you know, Courtney Hawkins is getting his flavor guys in there. He got Keon Coleman. He'll have a big year this year. Trey Mosley was a holdover. He'll be solid. But now you move into, you know, Terrell Henry, who I think turned out to be a good evaluation. And these two guys are good evaluations. I think wide receivers looking good for the future. And they'll go out looking for a big elephant hunter, you know, four-star guy somewhere next year again this year. This year they they settled down to these two guys, and they got a couple of three-stars that are four-star talents at wide receiver. So the one thing about Sean Brown, I will will say – like pump the brakes on, on this guy as a year as a guy that would be like a dark, dark question learned that comes out in year one you know this is a guy that's got a safety background he plays this is the first year like playing like at a high level at corner so he's comfortable with press but he hasn't mm-hmm. got into all his own concepts and, and whatnot the one thing that he has that you can't teach is ball skills mm-hmm. and, and you know we see time and again like how many how, how many times do we talk about coaches talk about high pointing the ball so great ball thing. skills and then the other thing that i think you know like from talking to some people like his high school coach like swears by his hip flexibility mm-hmm. and that's something that's rare for a guy that's six three you saw this year Amir speed had all the hype coming in mm-hmm. he did not have the hip flexibility no. to do what or or in my opinion the willpower to do what you know to be like a physical corner but um yeah justin lane that's, a, that's kind of a good frame of reference sean brown wasn't quite sure you know what to think, but then you start doing research, and then you know, and the fact that he's honest about his track speed. You know, Tucker says ten seven, he tells me no ten nine. Yeah, I like that guy, and he's got tons of confidence. Smooth hip turn. That's what my notes say right here. I'm glad his coach said that for a six three guy. Smooth hip turn, and you know, played some corner, some press corner, played some safety, can hit a little bit, um, but with that range, you get to where if you have a lot of those guys in the defensive backfield. Now, you know how they used Xavier Henderson as the season went along? You know, either safety, and then he played some nickel, and then he played some linebacker. So when the offense comes to the line of scrimmage, where's number three at? Well, Henderson can play a lot of different places and maybe come in and play man-to-man for, for one snap on a slot. This guy, Sean Brown, at 6'3", can go out and play safety, come up and play the run theoretically when he gets older. But the hip turn... You know, all of a sudden, you know, if he's in the slot, are they in zone or can he turn and play man to man? When you get that kind of versatility with range, I mean, with frames and hip turn, then you can really be multiple in your coverage and really screw with the quarterback's so, head. So one thing that the coach was telling me, he said that they had him at safety, and that's like the position he feels comfortable with because he's got he's got a high football IQ. He's uh, vocal, but he, but said he played it, some press corner but, too. But he said he said they had to move him to corner this year because at safety. Uh, in their league, they have a bunch of like D, like D1 caliber wide receivers or guys that get recruited. He's like, we can't on a week to on a game to game basis. I need a guy that can take away the best receiver, and he's the guy that can do it. Um, you know, so, Justin Lane. You know, so that that's something that like you know, sorry Sean, but we got to put you at corner, even though you're kind of the quarterback of on the back end at, at safety. I think it works out well. Uh, for Michigan State and, and faster than advertised. I think the other thing is I kind of pay attention to is how many coaches come out and see you sometimes and you know like he within the span of like two weeks and then at before getting the michigan state offer he was taking pictures with every single member of the arizona defensive coaching staff they were out at his high school and to me i know arizona's not too far away 
from California. But to me, when you have an entire defensive coaching staff in, in, a, in a football office. He's a priority for that, Arizona. That means he's a priority. And when you hear stuff like that, I think back to like the Shalit Calhoun type of deal. And I hear about how Rutgers pulled out all the stops for him. And those are the kind of things that resonate with me as one of those like, like clues. That's how you kind of know sometimes mm -hmm. whether one of these three-star guys Maybe he's going to be like a NFL guy or be a difference maker, an impact guy. And to me, that, that kind of note is something that struck a chord with me. Those 15 are good. Now, Jalen Thompson's got to keep working. He might move inside at some point. DePape's got to toe the line. Dellinger is going to come in and have to compete. And he's got an opportunity, but he's, you know, he's kind of in that, you know, kind of like that. Um, you know, Chris McDonald type of category. Who was the guy from Milford? The, 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 it was pretty, you know, or, or, you know, he's kind of. Oh, Joe. Uh, anyway, he, you know, he's he's got some work to do. Six foot three. He's got some ability, and it's going to be competitive in there. But he knows the process. You know, he's got you know his family background. His, you know, his dad's military. Like, there's a those guys understand that there's a process, and he's going to attack it. And I, I'm looking forward to seeing what those guys do. But this is kind of a fun class. You don't know how it's all going to work out, but man, there's a lot of plates being juggled this recruiting cycle. Joel Foreman. Joel Foreman. Hey, and I, before we go, I got to give kudos to Jason. Uh, oh, Jason Killip. Jason Killip just killed it. And, uh, you know, some of these guys, you know, like you and I both been doing like recruiting like features. But we can't do that kind of stuff unless we know what's going on ahead of time. And, and Jason has done a heck of a job. And, and I'm incredibly grateful to him. And Noah today, uh, Noah doing the Facebook stuff for, for us on the new, new site, but Noah has done a really good job of digging up information and helping us all, all around. So I want to give those two guys some major props because without what they do, we look like the dumbasses that we are. Yes. And I, I do that enough on a daily basis. I don't need to do it anymore. So Noah Sprunger, Jason Kill, a couple of young guys that are definitely... Uh, Thank you. And, and also these guys, I got to say, Jason is starting to develop so much news judgment and yeah. understanding of how all this stuff works together. Uh, you know, when to report something, a piece of information, when to hold back on it for his credibility's sake. That is so, that is so priceless in this in this business to be able to read. Uh, you know, to be able to be the detective, not to embarrass yourself. In a lot of times when that happens, it's not because you're doing something wrong. It's because you're overly exuberant. So he's developing a really great news judgment, and I'm really proud of him. He's come a long ways. Noah is doing a great job. Uh, I really like where we're at with our news organization. Young guy, Jake Laskawa, he's doing a great job for us too. So incredibly grateful for those guys and looking forward to seeing them grow and develop and become better than we are. Well said, Paul. Appreciate it. We're at Spartan Stadium right now. They're tipping off in 24 minutes, Paul, on the traffic. We're going to get trouble, so we got to get out of here. SpartanMag.com, VCAS, Conor Dye, Comproni. Thanks for checking in.